Well, it's my privilege tonight to introduce Pastor Glenn Forsberg. And uh, he's a very good servant of the Lord, committed to, to the Lord, committed to preaching the Word. Uh, one thing we also know about Glenn is that he likes to tell us a, a little bit about his, his ancestry. He's a Norwegian. And, of course, he, uh, he picks on others that aren't. Or and he picks on Norwegians, too. But most of all, he just preaches the gospel and does a good job. And his wife, Lois, is with him. And I think they have two children, right? And I don't know how many grandchildren. I didn't see how many fingers. Four. Four. Okay, and we'll stop there. He can go on with great-grands and so on as well. But uh, he is pastored in various churches in Canada. And uh, Fort McMurray was his last, a very big church there. But now he's, well, he's supposed to be retired. Anyway, he's a representative for the Fellowship of Christian Assemblies in Canada. And we are privileged to have him come and share with us for this uh, week of Bible camp. God bless you, Glenn, as you come and share the word this, this evening. Welcome. Thank you, Pastor Amen. Cliff. Yes. Amen. Love you and Donna. So good to see you. We go back a long ways. A long ways. Amen. I remember when I was just a kid on the farm, and uh, the Stallwicks and the, um, who was the other couple with you? The Dollas, yeah. Came together to our farm and uh, had dinner with my parents and us and uh, shared, I think, a Bible study that night and sharing your vision. And uh, that was about 150 years ago, you know. And, <laughs> and at that time, you know, we're not that much different in age, but then I thought you were an old couple, you know. I was just, you know, 15 or whatever. But somehow now you become young, you know. You guys are, just look so young. And uh, God has preserved you and kept you so well. So, uh, yeah, we just came back from Norway. We had a um, family vacation on a cruise ship. And... Uh, and we, hey, that's tough, exactly. And, uh, and so my daughter started it all, and uh, she, got, she said, we've got to have an anniversary holiday together as a family. Well, whenever they say family, I'm, I'm in. Lois and I, we're in. And uh, so she planned this cruise to Norway and five different fjords of Norway. And uh, our four grandkids and two of them are engaged to be married. So their fiancés were with us as well. So there was 12 of us on the ship for a whole week. And, uh, and then uh, seeing all these beautiful fjords. Coming through the mountains here, Lois and I took the scenic route to come down here. What a beautiful, beautiful park. This glacier park that you have here, just awesome. Almost as good as the Norwegian fjords. Maybe a little, even a little bit better. <laughs> but the fjords are absolutely uh, just uh, spectacular. And, uh, and the time we had together. But I'm here tonight just to say to you folks in America that we Canadians love you. There was a hundred and I don't know how many lined up at the border today to get into America. It took us an hour and a half to get across the border because all the Canadians are coming down here, you know. And, uh, and in spite of your higher money, they still come. And, uh, and, they, and they just love being here and we love being here. So, uh, and I love Americans. I married one. My wife is from Tacoma, Washington. And uh, we were married uh, a long time ago, in 1966. And uh, Lois came with me to Canada. And she's been with me ever since and, and uh, has become a Canadian citizen. So she carries two passports now. And, uh, but the best one is the one with heaven on it. Isn't that true for all of us? Amen. Yeah, so it's just great. Well, you know, why did you, you know, it's so good to be together. I've heard about this camp at Hungry Horse, I, I don't know for how many years. And my uncle and aunt, Gus and Helen Forsberg, always talked about Pastor Murud and uh, Hungry Horse Camp, though they'd never been here, but he had been in their home. And, uh, and they just loved him. So warm greetings from Aunt Helen. She's 96 years old, still got her own house and her own garden and and was so excited, I brought her some potatoes, 
you know, from fresh red tomatoes, uh, potatoes, and she was so excited about them. But she said, you're going to see the Stalwicks? I said, yeah. She said, hello. Big warm hello from her. Amen. So, uh, yeah, we live in Wetaskiwin, Alberta, uh, which is a small town, central Alberta. My wife and I have been pastoring for a number of years. Oh, and I started telling you about our anniversary. Carlene said, we've got to celebrate a hundred years of marriage. My wife and I have been married 50, and our kids have both been married 25. So that makes a hundred, you know. So we thought, that's something we're celebrating. And then, our, uh, and then, you know, this marriage thing has got the bug with our grandkids, and two of them want to get married now. They're saying, let us in on it. <laughs> and, uh, and the other two are younger. But, you know, it's so good for us to be married to Christ. And as a result, we are married to each other. And you know what? It's such a blessing to be able to sit together. And why don't you turn to your neighbor right now and just say, I'm so glad I got to sit with you. Amen. Even if it's your husband or wife or your brother or your sister. Amen. How long have you been having this camp here? How many years? Okay. So 39 years you've been having camp meetings here. What a privilege. What an honor. I love camp meetings. I got saved in a camp meeting. When I was nine years old, on the shores of Sylvan Lake, or pardon me, Pigeon Lake in Alberta, about four years later, I went back to that camp meeting and got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and then later, God called me to ministry, called my wife to ministry. We met in Bible school together, and uh, we've been serving the Lord together in various churches ever since. The last church was Fort McMurray, Alberta, as Pastor Stalwick indicated. Uh, we were there for 19 years, probably the most exciting 19 years we've had. Uh, Fort McMurray is a city that's on the move and on the go and creative and, and uh, entrepreneurism and uh, multicultural. Uh, we had 55 different nations in our church uh, from all around the world. And uh, we just were saying, this is what heaven's going to be like. You know, for every tribe, tongue, and nation. People are going to be gathered together to serve God. And that was such a thrill. It was very tough for us to leave. It was our decision to leave. We felt we needed to pass the torch to some younger blood and next generation people. But I went down the road bawling my eyes out and saying, oh, God. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, But we still have a great relationship there, and we're looking forward to getting back there this fall. I'm thankful for the privilege and the honor of being invited here. And I'm so looking forward uh, to meet you. You must be Rick and Rose back there. Is that right? <laughs> Amen. It looks like R&R &R from here, you know. And this is the first time I met them. You know, we, we communicated on, on, on the Internet, and, uh, but now we get to meet face to face. And what a beautiful song your girls sang together. God bless you. Amen. So, uh, and, I, and I'm privileged also to be able to speak with you uh, four, five times, five or six times, and uh, that gives me an opportunity to kind of work on a message called In His Image that uh, deserves uh, the attention of more than one night. And so we're going to be talking about that for the next while, and, uh, and tonight uh, will be the, the first night. And I'd like for you, if you have your Bible, you can turn to it in Genesis one twenty seven. Uh, but you might be able to see it on the screen here as well. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1, 27. Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful word of God. We thank you, Lord, for this camp meeting. Thank you, God, for bringing the people that are here and others that may be coming yet tomorrow. Lord, we just pray your blessing upon this, this, the, these days we have together, that we will appreciate you more than ever, and that we will appreciate belonging to one another more than ever. Though we've never met before, we've just met here at this campground, some of us, but we are brothers and sisters because of the adoption power of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for making us sons instead of slaves and that we have the privilege of belonging to the greatest family in the universe. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. 
God created man in his own image. That is such a powerful statement. God made us in his image. He wanted somebody like himself. So he decided to make people. And, uh, and we as people were designed and created not by ourselves, but by someone far greater than ourselves. And therefore, if you have come to Christ, if you have been born again by the Holy Spirit, if you become a child of God, all of a sudden, your perspective changes about everything, about the world you live in, your family, and about yourself. And perhaps before you were a believer, you would look in the mirror, and if you're a young person, you know, you'd look at zits and say, oh, where did they come from? <laughs> you know, and you'd look at this, and, and if you had an opportunity to change uh, something about yourself, whether it's looks or it's your behavior or it's your attitude or whatever, uh, you'd be thinking about that. You look in the mirror, and I don't know if you've ever done this, but I've done it to myself in my life. You stupid nut. Why did you do that dumb thing? You ever talk to yourself like that? <laughs> yes, a couple of you are honest. <laughs> hey, Amen. Yeah, and I used to look at myself, what in the world? What are you thinking? Why did you do that crazy thing? If I could do it over again. And I look at that guy and say, you better smarten up, you know. <laughs> and so I'd have these lectures. But you know, since becoming a Christian and since becoming a follower of Christ, some things have changed. And all of a sudden, I now see the guy in the mirror through the eyes of my Father in heaven. And the Father in heaven says, I made you in my image. And what is that image? Well, first of all, the image is not... Oh, before we talk about that, I, the next slide shows you some, uh, some uh, resources. Uh, that, uh, and I have a list of these I could share with you or leave with you, whatever. But these are resources that I think are tremendous help today in our world for you that are Christians and you're trying to navigate through life in a most crazy, mixed-up world. Have you ever seen people so confused as our day? Confusion runs rampant. We don't hardly know anything anymore. We don't know. Up is down, down is up, backwards is forward, forward is backwards. What's wrong is right. What's right was, used to be right is now wrong. All of these things have created total confusion and chaos in our world. You and I are here today to navigate in our world. One guy said to me, Glenn, I just want to escape somewhere to an island in the Pacific. He said, I am so disappointed with the world that I live in. He says, I don't think I belong anymore. Said, oh, no. I said, don't you go to an island in the Pacific. God's put you here. <laughs> You're one of the, the lights of the gospel in our community that God has put you here for. Amen? So, but, but we need some resources. And uh, Pastor Stalwick, of course, the founder of Clearwater College, uh, Living Faith Bible College, is here, Sister Stalwick. Uh, what, a, what a contribution you have made to the kingdom of God through that school over the many, many years that gr you've graduated people that are serving Christ in the world today. And, uh, and I recommend the school because, you know, among, besides the fact that the school is a Bible-based, Bible-teaching, evangelical school, Pentecostal school, or full gospel school, it is a school that is founded upon principle and is founded upon vision for the development of young men and women to serve Christ. And, uh, and to this day, they are continually moving forward in innovation. Uh, as many Bible schools are facing today, there's a lot of financial sp stress on Bible schools today, but God is helping living faith to move forward. I believe God's going to see tremendous victory in the days to come. Amen. So we want to see that school continue to go forward. And uh, you can get courses online or from Clearwater College now, as well as being a resident student, and you should uh, look it up. Uh, Finding Truth by Nancy Piercy. And uh, I have a few pages here, or a few pa um, introductions of her book I can leave with you here. One of the great uh, anth apologetic books by this incredibly studious lady uh, who writes in layman's language. And uh, Creation Research. I believe that the battle is beginning to be won by the creationists in our world today, because science is, become, is our friend. And science is proving to people over and over again that there really is a God. Creation Research, ICR, or Creation Ministries International, creation.com, 
And Anthony Flew, there is a God. I'll talk about him a little bit later. He writes an article with that title, but he also wrote a book uh, with that title, and we'll see it in a minute. Evidence for Jesus from Non-Christian Sources by Michael Cleghorn. Uh, incredible, incredible document. Uh, David Kinneman, who is the president and CEO of the Barna Group in America, uh, has written a book called You Lost Me. And he addresses the question of why millennials are leaving the church by the thousands in America. And uh, there's a lot of discussion on that. Right Now Media is a great, great tool. If your church has subscribed to it, it provides hundreds of subjects and courses being taught by some of the top instructors in America and around the world on most of those subjects. And if your church has subscribed to it, you can log into it for nothing and, uh, and, and get these courses. It starts at home. Chandler, Thomas, and Bruner write this book about how you can raise your children to have a relationship with God. You know, there's many parents today that don't know anything about raising their kids to know God. They believe the church is doing it. They believe somehow it's rubbing off of them because mom and dad are Christian, but they don't have a whole lot of Christian activity in their home. And how do you raise children for God, for children to get to know God in the world in which we live today? This is a great book by Matt Chandler and, and his friends. Bethinking.org for thinking Christians. And I believe God gave us a thinker to think. How about you? Amen. That's part of our reason to become a Christian is the fact that you've had some thoughts, making sense of the big questions in life. The Devil in Pew Number 7, written by Rebecca Alonza, an incredible story of a woman who grew up, grew up in a home that was targeted by a man in their community, and her daddy was a pastor, and what this individual did to this pastor and his family is beyond belief. You would not believe that it could be happening in, Western, in the Western world. And, and yet this book is written and told, tells the story of the forgiveness of this daughter, who is now a grown lady and married, has her own family, and she travels the country speaking on forgiveness. This book is so graphic, folks. I had to put it down sometimes. It, it's just, it just gut-wrenching. But at the end, my wife and I were reading it in bed one night, the last chapter, and both of us were just crying buckets of tears because of the message of forgiveness that this woman has shared. And if there's ever a need for forgiveness in anywhere in the world today, it's America and Canada, it is our countries, and it's this generation that needs to know how to forgive. We're always looking for a reason to forgive. In other words, a change in the other person's life. But God wants us to climb to new levels on the subject of forgiveness. I recommend that book. And then the YouTube testimony of a man I'll show you in just a few moments. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And what is the image of God? Well, number one, his person. The scripture describes God in anthropomorphic terms. In other words, in, in human terms, God's arm, God's eye, God's ear. When actually God has none of those in a physical sense because he's a spirit. So if God made you in his image, it wasn't the physical image that you see in your mirror. It is the emotional, spiritual mental, psychological image that you were made in the image of God. So much so that he has made you so much like him that he believes that you and him can communicate and understand each other. In fact, he goes so far that he wants to be known as your father. He not only wants to be known as your father, he wants to be known as your Abba father. In our language, it would be daddy father. <laughs> Hey, Papa, Daddy, not in a disrespectful way, not in a, in a you know, a, what should I say, a, an inappropriate way, but in an absolute loving way, Paul calls us to call him Abba Father. Jesus said, when you talk to my dad, you know how you should address him? Our Father. I want you to call him your Daddy. Wow. Talk about an incredible relationship with a God you cannot see with your natural eye, but a God whose fingerprints are everywhere in our world today. Everywhere, from a newborn baby to the solar system and the universe, you see the fingerprints of God. So 
The image of God is his person, his intellect, his emotion, his relationship capability, and his spiritual capability. All of those he's passed down to us. We have all of those qualities in our lives. We have an intellect that far supersedes the intellect of any other creature that God has made. And you also have the capacity to engineer and develop. You say, well, animals do that as well. Beavers, they engineer and develop dams. Yes, but they do the same thing over and over and over again. Mankind has the power and the ability to build a different kind of a dam. He can build different bridges. He can imagine and create stuff. And that's the next point we have here. God is a creator. So when he made you, he made you with creative abilities. He created you with the possibility of creating something. And uh, I remember an elderly man in our church in in, in uh, Fort McMurray, uh, and uh, he, uh, he was a, an incredible inventor. And he was getting older, and he cut his own wood. He would cut it and then split it and then pile it and then carry it. So he created a contraption, <laughs> and I'll call it that, out of a Datsun truck frame with its four-cylinder engine in it. And he attached to this four-cylinder engine on a frame a buzz saw to saw the log, and then he attached to it a splitter that would split the log, and then he attached to the splitter an elevator that would take it up to the pickup truck. And all he had to do was to push a lever to, get the, to make the saw cut this piece of wood. And he made it out of, just, well, I, it was a haywire thing, but it worked. And, uh, and it was amazing, that creation. Neighbors would come and watch him cut wood because of his invention, his creation. is incredible. And so when you look at God's creative ability, uh, one of the ways he gives us creativity is by giving us a mind to answer. The Soviet Union, you young people, did not live during the time of the Gulag Archipelago. Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote that book to describe what the Soviet Union was like. And uh, by the way, Uh, the leaders of the Soviet Union destroyed millions of the lives of their own people. If I remember right, uh, I'll probably show it later this week, I think it's something like 40 million people were killed at the hands of their own government, if you can imagine, because they 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 were practicing a new philosophy of life called communism, and they wanted everybody to learn together, except those who they killed, of course. Amazing. And so it was illegal to have more than five people together in a house because they would be suspicious that you were either, you know, contriving against the government or you were having a Bible study and all religion was not allowed. And so this man was walking down the street one day with his Bible under his coat going to a Bible study and a KGB officer confronted him, said, sir, where are you going? Well, I'm going over. This, this, this. Oh, what are you going there for? So the man was on the spot. He knew it was illegal to go to a Bible study. But he also knew that God was the higher law. But he also did not want to lie to the man. And so he answered the man this way. He said, I'm going to my brother's house because our older brother has died and we're going to read the will. Now, that's creativity. (laughs) God had to give him that answer. (laughs) He didn't lie. He was telling the truth. But the man didn't understand what he was saying. (laughs) And so, I really thank God for the privilege that we have of believing that God can give you creative powers. He can give you ideas that just are downloaded from heaven. And I believe there's people here tonight that could testify about something that came from heaven to you that solved a problem in your life at some point in your life. You did not know how you're going to get out of it. You did not know how you're going to solve it, but God downloaded something into your life. It was pure creativity, and you did it, and it worked. Wow, isn't that awesome? Folks, we are not just, you know, descendants of lower forms of life struggling in a world that has no purpose, no destiny, and no reason for being. You and I are people that were created by the mind of God to be creative people 
who are his sons and daughters. Isn't that powerful? To have his personality become our personalities. That we can look like him. That we can talk like him. That we can live like him. In the Second World War, when London was bombed out, we were in London, by the way. We boarded our ship there uh, with our kids just a, couple, a week and a half ago. And uh, it was hard to believe that this city was bombed in the Second World War, the way the pictures I've seen has described it. But we walked through that beautiful city and went to Buckingham Palace and those things. We only had a day to be there. But uh, after the war was over and the city was in rubble and ruin, um, an American soldier came on his jeep around a corner, and he knew there was a bakery that was still operating. And he went there to buy some sweet dough for his comrades. And uh, as he came around the corner, he saw this young boy, maybe eight or nine years old, with his face pressed against a few of the glass windows that were still remaining, this glass window in the bake shop. And as the man looked through the window, he saw the baker pulling out fresh donuts out of the oven. And the boy was just salivating. He was just skin and bone, just a waif. And, uh, and the man went in, the, the soldier went in, and he bought two bags of donuts, one for him and his colleagues and one for the boy. When he came out of the bakery, he handed the donuts to the boy. And he went to his Jeep. And he's about to get into his Jeep. He felt somebody pulling on his pant leg. And he turned around, and here was the boy holding the donuts, pulling on the soldier's pant leg. And he said, hi, son. And the boy looked up into the man's eyes, and he said, Mr., are you God? Totally serious. Are you God? You may not know. If you are a disciple follower of Jesus Christ, there could very well be somebody in this world who's asked that same question about you. Maybe not necessarily that you being God, but you must have some God qualities in you. Why? Because of the way you live. Because of your attitude. You march to a different drummer. You don't live a life that's all about me. You've found a life that's all about him. And you've discovered that the greatest joy in life is to be a giver. The most refreshing lake in this area is the one that has a river going in and a river going out. The most stagnant lake is the one that has a river going in and nothing going out. Those and I were in Israel a few years ago, and we were able to go to the Dead Sea. Beautiful. Caribbean blue sea. It looks awesome. And you really can't drown in it. I laid on the water like I'm laying on a couch. I tried to stand up in it. I went into water over my head, like maybe eight or nine feet. And I stood in the water like a pop bottle floating in it, you know, with this much of me sticking out in the bottom below. You can't sink in that sea. It's so full of minerals and salts and everything. But don't you dare get a drop in your mouth. <laughs> It'll kill you. It's horrendous. If you drink it, you'll die, no question. Or if you get it in your eye. It looks great, but it ain't so great. But you know, the freshwater sea looks good and tastes good. Amen? And God wants you and I to be freshwater people. And then his attributes are fruit of the Spirit, with special emphasis on love, joy, peace. Love, joy, peace, you know, meekness, long-suffering, all of those qualities. But the first three are especially powerful of God. God is love. God didn't, doesn't just love. He is love. He can't do anything else but love. God loves people. Amen. He loves people. They were the last part of his creation. And they were the highest part of his creation. He decided to make man in his own image. But in order to do that, he had to create a home for man. So he began with a universe. Then he built the solar system. And then he built the earth in the solar system. 
And it's the only inhabitable planet that we know of, certainly in our solar system, and we've not seen it in our Milky Way or anywhere else yet. There could be beings inhabiting other planets in our universe. We've not been there yet. And there's nothing in the Bible that says there couldn't be. So there could be, but we don't know of any. We're the only one in our solar system, and we're the only one in our near neighborhood that has water, which is absolutely essential for life. And not just water, but liquid water. And liquid water is only liquid within a few degrees, from zero to 100 degrees centigrade, 32 to 212 Fahrenheit. eh? That little margin of heat has to be what water experiences in order for it to be liquid. And if you didn't have liquid water, we wouldn't be here. And we're the only planet that we know of that has a temperature for water between those places long enough to cause us to drink water and to live water. And so, a lot we could say. This is our home. Don't you love it? Wow. The next slide. This is the nine planets that go around the sun. What a beautiful creation. Incredible. Our God is a genius God. And we don't have time tonight, but each one of those planets are necessary for our earth in order for our earth to be here and to be habitable. Our moon is necessary for us to be inhabiting this earth. It all works together like clockwork to make the earth work. Isn't that amazing? The next slide. Our galaxy. Now, our galaxy, they tell us, is 100,000 light years across. If you were to travel to the sun, 93 million miles from here, at the speed of light, it would take you eight minutes. You would get to the sun in eight minutes. For you to get from one side of our galaxy to the other would take you 100,000 years going at the same speed. That gives you just a little idea of how colossal our galaxy, the Milky Way, Milky Way is. And of course, there's billions of stars in our galaxy. And some of them could be suns for other Earths. We do not know that. But that's just one galaxy. Scientists today think there probably are billions of galaxies in the universe. Right now, the switches in my brain are all going down because I can't even imagine our galaxy, let alone billions in a universe. It's beyond understanding. The next slide shows some of the other galaxies that we've been able to take pictures with from the Hubble spacecraft, the Cat's Eye Nebula. Isn't that beautiful? The next one, the Eskimo Galaxy, gorgeous. The next one, the Sombrero Galaxy. Look at the colors, it's just amazing. And of course, it's millions of light years out there. You're never going to get there until you get to heaven, you know. The next one, Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon. He said, when he looked back to Earth, I felt very, very small. He's the guy that said, one step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I remember that on the radio. How many remember hearing that? You're over 40, right? <laughs> and, and there he was, hopping on the moon. I mean, just bouncing like a jackrabbit because it's low gravity. It was just bong, a bong, a bong. Made me want to be there with him, you know, except I wanted to get home, you know. <laughs> and uh, when he's, he's passed away now. The next slide. When Voyager 1, which was launched in 1977, uh, took off, today it's uh, 2017, <clears throat> when it was leaving the solar system just a year and a half ago, a couple years ago now, leaving our solar, it took that long from 1977 until about 2015 to get to the edge of our solar system. Not even in, into our galaxy yet, been into the edge of our solar system. And as it was coming to the edge, Carl Sagan, who's a brilliant scientist, not a believer, he's atheist, but he asked at NASA if they would turn the camera of Voyager 1 back towards Earth. And so they agreed to do that. They turned the camera back towards Earth, and this is all they could see from 6 billion kilometers away, a little blue dot in a streak of light within our galaxy. And by the way, folks, that is one of the only places in our galaxy where our solar system could survive. 
is exactly where it is. There are so many conditions for habitable life on this planet to make it possible that it becomes impossible not to believe in an intelligent designer, an intelligent engineer, and an intelligent creator. But there it is. The next slide. Psalm 8. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. This is what the psalmist is asking the Creator. And folks, there are people in our world today that are thinking the same thing. When I look at the heavens and the universe, I think, like Neil Armstrong, we are very small. We are very insignificant. I mean, why are we here? And uh, secular humanism, we'll talk about one night, uh, tells us we don't know why we're here. (laughs) Secular humanism says that you do not have an identity, you don't have a purpose for being, and you have no security. And uh, because there really is no intelligence behind your existence, and therefore there's no purpose for you being here. And so what is it all about? And so the psalmist was saying that. When I look at the universe, I think of ours, uh, us people on this planet. And if you look at our, our earth, and then our sun, and the planets, and then the galaxy, and then the galaxies... You can describe our world as a speck on 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 a speck. We are so insignificant. We are so small in the universe. And then we, humans, walking on this planet, we're so small. We're not even mice. We're little bed bugs or something. I mean, we're just so small and oh, so insignificant. <laughs> That's what we think. But God thinks differently. Amen. What is man that you are mindful of him? And God could have answered right there. Before the universe was created, I had you on my mind. I was already engineering your life. Ephesians chapter 1. Before the foundations of the world were established, you were on his mind. You were the purpose for creating the world. Isn't it amazing? Hallelujah. I'm excited. How about you? We're into something here, folks. And as we go through this subject on this week, it's just going to get better. I tell you what, what we're talking about here this week could transform our world if people would believe it. And I hope, first of all, that all of us in this camp meeting will believe it already. Or if you haven't believed it yet, by the time the week is over... You will. Amen. The miracle of water. That's one of the questions. We could, uh, you know, we could look at so many things. Uh, Like I said a little while ago, scientists today are leaving, many of them are leaving the evolutionary model, the unguided evolutionary model, to the creationist model, not because of the Bible, but because of science. And Anthony Flew was one of them that did it. Anthony Flew was the best-known evolutionary uh, atheist in England. And, um, and he, and he, uh, he uh, denied, he's a very respectful man, very gentleman, but very powerful. He's written over 55 years. He's written all kinds of textbooks and uh, scientific papers, and you can read them, go on the, on the Internet, and uh, see how he leaves God out of the picture. But in 2004, Anthony Flew wrote a book, uh, wrote a thesis on reasons why I have become a deist. He didn't become a Christian, but he became a deist, a believer in an intelligent being. He said, my science, over the past 20 years, I have been on a journey of skepticism of my own beliefs. And after 20 years of finding questions to which there is no answer other than an intelligent creator I have had to believe. And so he writes this book, There is a God Scratching Out the No. And if you have, if you're skeptic about 
creationism, you need to read that book. <laughs> if you're skeptic about the science world, you need to read that book. Uh, there's a lot of great scientists in our world on both sides of the equation, creationists, evolutionists. And there's many, many people that are becoming believers uh, today because of science. And so uh, have a look at that. Okay, the next slide. We also had the scripture on the first page when we started. The thief comes to rob, steal, kill, and, kill and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. Amen. <laughs> oh. A lot of us today have reasons to cry. A lot of us people today have reasons to be disappointed and to hurt and to have pain. But guess what? God doesn't want you to live there. He doesn't want you to live there. When Paul was in prison in Philippians chapter 1, he said, you guys are feeling so sorry about me. You guys are, he didn't say it in these words, but he could have. You guys are weeping over me. Or you're feeling bad for me and you're just, you're, you're throwing up your hands. They say, Paul is in prison again, being mistreated, being beaten, being shackled in chains. Paul writes back, he says, guys, don't sweat it. It's awesome what God's doing in here. In fact, my chains are turning people around. And when you read the last chapter of Philippians, and the last few verses, Paul says, greet all the people that I want you to greet. But I want you to know there's people here that want to greet you, especially those who belong to Caesar's family. Caesar's family were becoming converted to Christ because of a Jewish imprisoned man in their jail, and they could not understand him for any other reason other than he really met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And as a result, members of Caesar's family became Christians, and they now are greeting the Philippians. And that whole story of Philippians is another great story we may tell later on. Through Christ, the thief has been robbed. I love that scripture. <laughs> the thief comes to rob, steal, kill, and, kill and destroy, but, <laughs> but, what does he say? Hmm? Pardon? But I have come. You're messing with a thief, or the thief is messing with you. But I have come where you are. I have come here. The Son of God, the one who created the universe. You say, Glenn, it wasn't him, it was God. Well, he happens to be God. And Hebrews 1, verse 1, says that the world was created by him. John 1, 1 says the same thing. And so... Jesus is the creator God, and he somehow fits himself into human skin for 33 years, walks on this planet, and shows us what God is like. And he brings us a gift, eternal life. <laughs> eternal life is not eternal just for quantity, it's eternal for quality. Amen. He changes your quality of life completely. Before it was, oh, lonesome me. Oh, no, i got to wait in this long line at the grocery store. Oh, my goodness sakes. You know, my neighbors walked on my lawn. You know, all the terrible problems we have in life, you know. But you are transformed when you become a child of God. All of a sudden, your values have shifted. Amen? And Paul writes to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians uh, 5, and he says, from now on, we regard no one from an earthly point of view. Though on one day, we looked at Jesus like that. We looked at Jesus from our human eyeglasses. And we judged him according to our human desires and wants and wishes. And we condemned him. That's what they did. Condemned to the cross because they judged him according to the human eyes. But he says, now I think of Jesus a whole lot differently. And I also think of the world a whole lot differently. And I think of people a whole lot differently. So instead of wanting to put people in prison that put him in prison, 
He is now praying for the prisoners and the jail keepers to come to Christ. Incredible transformation. So the perception of life has completely changed. Now here's, here's, here's the bottom line for tonight, folks. You and I did not choose the family we're born into. You did not choose your mom and dad. That was a choice beyond yours. You did not choose where you were born, what country, what community, what economy, what political system. You had none of that. There's people from other parts of the world today that, in Syria, for instance, that are being killed by their own leader. Again, same thing happening. There are people that were born in horrendous situations, and I'm going to show you a clip of one right now. To whom the world would not give a fighting chance to survive. But when Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, my sins are washed away. When Jesus comes, I live a new day, a new life, and a new hope. Let's watch that clip, Brother James. This clip is the story of a man who today is an advisor to presidents, prime ministers, the National Football League in America, and a lot of companies bring him in as a, as a motivator. But fundamentally, he's a preacher. Now, listen to his story. At this point, we watched a three-and-a-half-minute testimony from Ron Archer about a trick baby. Please find and watch this video on YouTube. This is what Jesus came to do. The thief came to rob, steal, kill, and destroy the life of Ronaldo. And if he was still living as a human being, he would be living as a dysfunctional, horrifically sad person who may be finding his, what you say, comfort among people who were like the madam of his mother. Who knows? But Jesus came and saved him to a life that was different than anybody in his family had ever known before. And today, his mom is a Christian, and he talks to his mom, loves his mom, <laughs> changed her life as well. Where would that family be if it wasn't for Christ? If there was no creator, if there was no recreator, if there was no cross, if there was no empty tomb, where would we be, folks? You and I are here tonight because we are privileged by God. We live on a privileged planet. We live in a privileged day. We live by a privileged God and a privileged Savior. Amen. Who has given us the opportunity to hope. Amen. God help us and deliver us, folks, from the despair and the depression and the discouragement that so many people are feeling in our countries today. We feel it in Canada. And I'm sure you feel it in America at times. But you know, Jesus didn't come to leave people in depressed states. He came to deliver us out of it. Amen. And to give us a hope and a future, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that is blessing this audience of people right now. God, I thank you that we are candidates for blessing. And Lord, that you have chosen to bless your children. And Lord, we realize how important it is for kids to have the blessing of their father. And Lord, you're our father. And you, you, you extended your blessing before we even asked it. We didn't even ask for it. And you wanted to bless us. And Father, today we pray you'll help us to experience that blessing. Intellectually, emotionally, Lord. Mentally, physically, spiritually, in every way. We will walk in the blessing of God. And we will understand, Lord, your creation within each one of us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Ronaldo before saw himself as a loser. No hope. No future. But now he sees himself as a man in the image of God. And it's transformed his whole family. I dare say that's probably a testimony from some of you folks. Where your families have been transformed by the blessing of God. By discovering our true identity comes from the Father in heaven. Amen. The Father of us all.
God bless you.